Welcome to Exploring Computing. Today's video is strings. So in this video, we're going to take a look at a closer look at how strings work. And uh, I want to start off with this problem that we ran into in the last video. So you recall I was writing to a file and I had two write statements. I wrote go Stanford and then I wrote go Cardinal. And instead of ending up with go Stanford on one line and go Cardinal in the other line, when we actually opened up the file, we discovered that go Stanford and go Cardinal end up on the same line. So how am I going to fix this? All right. So up on the top here, we have what we ended up with. And down at the bottom, we have what we want. So if we were to represent these as strings, um, this is what we would have here. So up at the top, quote, go Stanford, go Cardinal. That's what we ended up with. And then the second one, go Stanford slash N go Cardinal. What is this slash N? All right, that slash N is what we refer to as an escape sequence. And in this particular case, the slash N represents new line, which inserts a carriage return. Now, as we talked about in the very first lecture of the quarter, um, there are different ways computers use to represent the end of line, and it's different depending on whether we're working with Unix machines or we're working with Windows machines. And if you have a really old, old, old Mac, they represent it a different way. And Python, the Python interpreter is actually going to uh, know the proper representation for your specific computer, and it will translate that slash n into the exact sequence of ASCII characters uh, or Unicode characters that is necessary for the particular computer you're working on. But just so we have a general way of doing it for any type of computer that Python is designed to work with, we're just going to represent it with a slash n. This is called an escape sequence because that backslash there indicates to Python that the next character that it sees is not to be treated normally. I'm supposed to escape the normal sequence of treating characters and do something special with the next character. So don't treat that N there after the slash as just a regular N that I print out an N out on the output, which is what you would normally do if you saw an N. It says, no, this is something different. Uh, there's, a, there's a special table uh, of escape sequences. Look it up in the table of escape sequences and do what it says there. And it looks it up in the table and it says, oh, that slash N is not a regular N. That is actually a carriage return. And so there's a couple of these. So uh, probably the most common you'll run into are the slash n's and the slash t's. Slash n represents new line or carriage return. Slash t represents a tab. And so here uh, I've got the string Stanford slash n slash t slash t university. And so that actually represents Stanford followed by a new line followed by two tabs. And if we were to actually look at the output, this is what we would see. We would see Stanford on one line university on the next line, but not university at the beginning of the line because there are those two slash t's representing tabs. So university tabbed over a bit. Here's a couple more escape sequences you might run into. Um, one question is, how do you represent a backslash? You can't just put a backslash there because that starts the escape sequence. And so if you really want a backslash, not super common, but if you really want a backslash, you have to put two backslashes in a row. The first backslash says, that's escape character, get out of the normal sequence. Uh, and the next backslash says, oh, uh, this particular sequence is backslash backslash, which represents a single backslash. All right, we also need one for representing quotes. So uh, if I wanted a quote, um, I would represent that with a backslash quote. Why would I want to do that? Well, suppose I actually want a quote in the output. So suppose I wanted the output, quote, give them the ax, end quote a traditional Stanford cheer. If I were to just put this in a string, this is what the string would look like. And you can see by my little not sign or cancel sign at the end, don't do this. Uh, what's going to happen here is I start off the string with a quote and I end the string with a quote on the far right after cheer. And then I place my double quotes in the middle. And so the way this is actually going to be interpreted by Python is it's going to see that first pair of double quotes, the initial double quote followed by the double quote for give them the ax. And I'll say, oh, that's a little string right there. And you may recall from the last lecture, we have a string and there's no characters in it that is completely legal. Uh, and that is what we refer to as an empty string. And then it will just see the quote after the word ax followed by dash a traditional Stanford cheer followed by quote. And I'll say, okay, that's a string. 
um, because really what it's doing is it's mashing up the pairs of double quotes here. And that'll say, but you've got these words here, give them the ax. I, I don't know what that is, Patrick. I think this is illegal. I think you need to fix your Python code. So this won't work. Um, this won't work because the double quotes are paired up. And uh, because they're paired up, I can't put actual double quotes into the string that I'm trying to create. So the way I get around this is by the slash quote. So, so I say quote slash quote or backslash quote, uh, give them the ax backslash quote, a traditional Stanford cheer. What's gonna happen is it's gonna see that first double quote and it's gonna see the slash double quote and it will see the slash first and it'll say, okay, so the next character I see, which happens to be a double quote, don't just treat that like a double quote. So don't treat it as if, you know, that matches with the original double quote. No, that's a special character. That is, it should not be treated as a double quote. Uh, character which would terminate the string with our empty string there, that's actually, oh, I want a double quote in the actual output, not as a delimiting character delineating when the string starts and when the string ends. So if you happen to need a double quote into string, that's how you would do it. All right, um, if you want to start doing some fancier things with strings, uh, one of the things to be aware of is that strings actually work pretty similar to lists. So uh, list and strings both act as sequences, and there are certain things that you can do with sequences in Python. And um, as we saw previously, in order to access individual elements in a list, we have this square bracket notation. So in this case, we have a list of team members, and I say I want to print the second team member, but you'll recall it actually starts off numbered at zero. So Casey would be zero, Hank would be one, Tammy would be two, and so this would actually print the word Tammy. Um, and here I've got a name, uh, which is a string, Stanford, and I tell it to print name bracket zero. And so what this is going to do is I can access each of the individual characters in the string. So string, uh, so name zero would be S, name one would be T, name two would be A, name three would be N, and so on. So in this case, if I say print name zero, that actually prints uh, the S. I should caution you though, in contrast to the elements of the list where I can access the individual elements on the list and not only access and get the information out, uh, with the list, I can actually place elements in the list. We can't actually do this with strings. Um, so if I were to try and replace uh, that S with some other letter, that actually is not going to work. All right. Um, we also saw previously that we can get the length of a list of items. And so here I am taking length of the course list number of classes. And so this would like, I think our example, we had three classes. So this would print, I'm taking three classes and we could do the same thing with strength. So if I say length name, where name is the strength Stanford, that would actually print the number eight because there are eight characters in Stanford. One thing that you may have noticed when I've been talking about uh, taking advantage of some of the features built into Python, uh, you may have noticed a difference between uh, different ways that we're accessing these. So, uh, you know, I've told you, hey, you know, you can go ahead and get the length of something. You can go ahead and print something out. You can go ahead and close a file. You can go ahead and append a file. And there is actually a difference between how these were accessed. Um, some of them, I just had the name of the, uh, what we refer to as a function, uh, followed by a pair of parentheses, followed by whatever information we needed. So length followed by the variable that's storing a sequence, uh, originally a list of items. Uh, now we can see that you can either pass in something referring to a list of items, or you can pass in something referring to string, and it will go ahead and print out the number of items in the string. Um, we've definitely been doing this with the print statement. Um, we can print say print and then pass in a string or a number and it will go ahead and print it out. And in fact, we saw that you can uh, actually ask it to print a bunch of things in the same line. So those are what we refer to as functions. So with the functions, you just have the name that I've told you to use. So length or print or whatever, followed by the pair of parentheses. In contrast, this other way of doing things uh, are, is something referred to as a method. With a method, we have an existing variable that is referring to uh, an item. Uh, followed by a dot, followed by the name of, you know, this method I've told you to use, followed by a pair of parentheses. So with, with 
closing a file, I have the name of a variable, which is referring to file, followed by dot, followed by close, followed by pair parentheses. And we also saw this with a pen. So with a pen, I had the name of a variable, which was referring to a list, followed by a dot, followed by a pen, followed by the item that I want to append to that list. So I don't want to go too much into the technical details here, but I did want to acknowledge that, that yes, there are two things that look like they're kind of doing the same thing, but they have different syntax rules. So the main thing for our purposes is they have totally different ways of accessing them. I don't say totally different, but they, they have different, distinct, clearly different ways of accessing them. So you do need to know whether you're working with a function or a method. And um, in terms of why they're different, in some cases, you could do one or the other. But what's really going on is there are differences in how the functions versus the methods are used for organizing uh, programs when you're writing complex programs, whether you use one or the other is going to have an effect on how your overall programs organized. And uh, there are definitely differences in terms of how they're implemented. The functions are easier to uh, write on your own. Um, in order to understand how the methods work, it's actually fairly messy. You need quite a bit of uh, understanding of the details of how Python works in order to properly use the methods. All right, so with that little discussion, I've got a bunch of methods I want to talk about. Um, and we're going to need uh, some of these to work with files, so um, bear with me here. The first couple we don't need to use for files, but uh, they're pretty straightforward, so I want to start off with these. Okay, so the isDigit method returns true if a string is composed only of digits. So let's say, um, you know, I've been reading for files, and I've been converting the numbers by calling uh, int or float and converting the numbers. Maybe we've got a file that has a bunch of numbers mixed in with a bunch of names, and I only want to convert the ones that are actually numbers. How would I know which one's a number and which one isn't? Well, so one way you can do that is there's an is digit that works on strings, and it returns either true or false. Um, you can see our little example here, if data dot is digit. So that's our uh, method invocation that we saw a minute ago. Name of a variable referring to string followed by a dot followed by the name of the method, which in this case is it's digit, followed by a pair of parentheses. Uh, whether or not that pair of parentheses is empty or not depends upon the particular method we're using. Um, okay, so if data is digit, print is a number, else contains letters or symbols. So uh, if data were a variable storing the string one, two, three, four, uh, data dot is digit would say, yes, this is entirely consisting of digits. So it would go ahead and print is a number. Okay, is alpha is sort of the opposite. Uh, is alpha says this is going to return true if the string is only composed of letters of the alphabet. So if data dot is alpha prints all letters, else print contains numbers or symbols. And so if data is set to quote Z24, this would print contains numbers or symbols because of the 24 in there. All right, so here's the here's the ones we really need. Um, so I mentioned this concept of white space before. White space refers to any character that creates blank space on the screen. So that's pretty much the spaces. You know, if you have a whole bunch of spaces, that's obviously going to generate a bunch of blank space on, on in the document. If you have a bunch of tabs, that generates a bunch of white space in the document, blank space in the document. The carriage return, if you have a bunch of carriage returns, you're creating a bunch of blank lines. And so that's going to create a lot of blank space in the document. So again, these characters that are creating these blank spaces, we sort of group them all together and say, oh, th those are characters that are generating white space. And so these are methods that remove white space. Lstrip removes white space on the left side of the string. Rstrip removes white space on the right side of the string. And then strip removes white space on either side of the string. So let's take a look at how these will work. Okay, so let's say we have this uh, string here stored in the variable original where we've got a bunch of spaces followed by Stanford, followed by a slash n, followed by a slash t. So that slash n, that's my new line character, the slash t, that's the tab. And so both the spaces and the slash n on the slash t, that's all white space. So if I create a new variable called data, and I say what I want to store in data is the original string, and then call the method strip on it, that it's going to remove white space from both sides. So it'll remove the spaces at the beginning of the string. It will remove the slash and the T at the end of the string. 
And so when we're done with this, the variable data will store the string quote Stanford end quote without the spaces, without the slants, and without the slash t. Those will all go away. Now, uh, if you want to, I think it's less common to need to strip the white space from just one of the sides. But if you wanted to, if we were to do, for example, R strip, this strips off the white space on the right side of the string, uh, which in this case is the slash and then the slash T, but it leaves the white space on the left side of the string. So in this particular case, data would be set to quote space space Stanford because the white space on the left side of the string is left and only the white space on the right side of the string is removed. All right, so uh, why do I wanna do this? Why do I care about this? All right, so it turns out that when I'm reading strings from a file, uh, it's actually going to leave uh, the new lines at the end of each character. I've alluded to this a little bit earlier. So here I'm reading a bunch of names from a file uh, and storing them in a list. Um, if my list contains the following names, uh, Patrick, Molly, Craig, Tammy, and Chloe, the actual list that I'm going to end up with says, quote, Patrick slash N, quote, Molly slash N, slash Craig slash N, and so on. So, um, you know, I, I, we've, we've talked before about how that end of the line is actually represented by an actual, you know, bit sequence, uh, whether we're using ASCII or Unicode or whatever our character encoding is there is a bit sequence associated with the end of the line. And so what we're seeing here is that Python is going ahead and just copying those over and saying, hey, there's a character at the end of the line. I'm just going to go ahead and put it in your, uh, you know, when you read the line, I'm going to go ahead and not only include the visible characters, I'm also going to include that invisible end of line character. Um, you may also notice that uh, this list down at the bottom uh, that Python has given us is marking its strings with single quotes instead of double quotes. So it turns out that in Python, you can represent strings either with single quotes or you can represent with double quotes. I've been using double quotes because most programming languages use double quotes. So if you were to continue on studying computer science and you were used to having single quotes for your strings, that would be a bad habit to get into. However, uh, while Python is perfectly happy to accept double quotes when we're writing our code or when you're interacting with the Python shell, um, in fact, when it spits the strings back to you, it always uses the single quotes. I'm not quite sure why they did it, but um, anyway, so you will see those single quoted strings when you're working with the Python shell. Um, you know, you can use single quote strings if you want, but again, I think it's a bad habit to get into because most languages uh, require you to use double quotes. All right, so you know, probably I don't want all those slash ends at the end of each of these names. It just seems kind of annoying. I don't know about you, but if I have a kid, I'm not naming it with a slash n at the end of their name. Maddie does not have a slash n at the name of her, end of her name. Um, okay, so how am I going to get rid of it? Well, here's a new version of the uh, code that's going to read. It's going to read the names from our file. Um, and you can see what I've done here is I've just added name.rstrip. So what this is going to do is this is going to read each of the individual names. So I've got a little for loop, name and data file. And so name is going to be set to each of the lines of text from our, our data file here, uh, our names file here. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to strip off any of the extra white space uh, on the right side uh, before I start into my name list, before I append it on the end of my name list. So in this case, those slash ends, which occur at the end of each line, that's just going to get stripped off by the R strip. And so you can see I end up with a list that I want, which is the list of the names from the file without the slash ends on the end. All right, that's it for now. I'll talk to you all soon.